time once again for Community Forum. And we are very lucky to have with us live in the studio this morning, Susan Abuhawa. Susan Abuhawa is a human rights activist and frequent political commentator. She is the founder and president of Playgrounds for Palestine, a children's organization dedicated to upholding the right to play for Palestinian children. Her essays and political commentaries have appeared in numerous print and international news media, and she is a contributing author of two anthologies, Shattered Illusions and Searching Janine, and author of several books, including My Voice Sought the Wind, Mornings in Janine, and she is here to talk about her new book, The Blue Between Sky and Water. Susan, thank you very much for coming in and spending time with us today. Thank you, Mike. Good morning. So start out, tell us, what was your motivation in writing your latest book, The Blue Between Sky and Water? Um, well, I just want to clarify that it's a novel. They're, they're mm -hmm. fictional accounts. Um, the, uh, the Blue Between Sky and Water is a um, historic fiction. Um, it's a multi-generational family saga set um, primarily in Gaza, but also in the U.S. Uh, it starts in the early, um, in the 40s, before the establishment of Israel, and kind of goes, follows this family through um, the Nakba, which was the, the catastrophe, the dispossession of Palestinians from their ancestral lands. Um, and they go into uh, a refugee camp in Gaza, and it, it, goes, it's, um, it goes through successive generations in that single family through um, various, against a backdrop of um, historic events that have happened that some people might be familiar with. Um, but it's primarily a women's story. <clears throat> um, the, the principal characters are women, again, in the same family. Um, Nazmiya is, uh, is the sort of um, wise-cracking, foul-mouthed matriarch. <laughs> um, and, and Nur, who, her niece, um, is uh, a woman who sort of gets lost in the United States. She ends up in the U.S. and um, with her, her grandfather, who's Nazmiya's brother, and she grows up in the foster care system and eventually finds her way back to Gaza. So um, they're parallel stories, and Nazmiya has a daughter of her own, and then she has a daughter. Um, and it's how these women sort of navigate their lives through wars, through dispossession, um, love, uh, sexuality, uh, motherhood, um, uh, loss, I mean, all, all the things of living, just um, ordinary ordinary women set against an extraordinary um, historic and, and political backdrop. And how much of your own experience has been woven into your book, your characters? Um, <clears throat> Noor uh, I grew up in um, for for a time in foster care in North Carolina, so I drew a lot on my experience um, in the foster care system to uh, to for, for Noor's life, and I, I put her in uh, in a lot of the the realities and experiences that I that I went through. So, for example, she um, the, she ends up in a home called Mills Home. It's a Baptist, it's a Southern Baptist children's home in Thomasville, North Carolina, and uh, it's that's where I lived. So. Um, I did, uh, uh, you know, all those, <laughs> those, those years that seemed, you know, difficult um, were actually kind of a, a treasure for me uh, of experiences that I get to draw on um, for these characters. And, um, you know, the, the, the cultural context, uh, the Palestinian context is, of course, part of my own background. It's my own family, my own um, experience prior to coming to the U.S., um, so of course I draw on that, and um, I also did a, a, a lot of research. I always do a lot of research for for everything um, I write, even when it's fiction. And um, I've been to Gaza multiple times. Um, I have a, a lot of people there that who are dear friends, people I love. Um, so I I think you know I always put a lot of myself, um, not necessarily my own precise life experiences, but my own sense, of course, of, uh, of the world um, that, uh, that I perceive. Um, I think, you know, writers, you write what you know in, in your gut. So, yeah, M my heart is in it, of course, too. The 
media reviews of your book so far and I believe your previous book talk about you know strong women characters and we were just talking before we went live that isn't strong women redundant yeah <laughs> Um, yeah, I always kind of cringe at that term. I mean, I know what people mean and what they're trying to say when they when they talk about strong women. Um, <clears throat> but sometimes it almost feels like a, a qualifier that, you know, otherwise women saying women alone would um, denote weakness. You know, we never say, you know, it's a story of strong men. Um, but we always feel the need to say, to qualify women as strong. Um, I think it is redundant. I think women, particularly <clears throat> women in all societies, um, carry society in many ways, but particularly in situations of of conflict and violence and deprivation, um, women assume uh, social burdens um, in a, in a in a profound way. Um, whether it's you know a lot of times they they're forced to become breadwinners. Um, they're, you know, they're mothers and, uh, and, and, and wives and sisters and, and the, the carriers of, um, of culture and tradition. And um, in Palestinian society, matriarchs are particularly uh, held in, in high um, esteem and reverence, um, even though it is largely a patriarchal society. And in fact, don't they really lead the indigenous resistance? It, exactly, but they never get credit, of course. <laughs> and I think that's true in um, in a lot of cultures, in Palestinian society, like even in the first Intifada, you know, which started with um, protests and and people uh, taking to the streets. It actually was before the men came out and started taking to the streets. It was women protesting and women and their kids and going to checkpoints and and, um, and, and gathering in these um, marches and protests. And, but of course, it's when the men sort of step on the scene that it becomes, um, uh, it becomes a movement. And uh, so, yeah, you're absolutely right. Women are almost often always at the forefront and, uh, but rarely is that even acknowledged. Um, it's certainly true in Palestinian context. It was true in the civil rights movement. It was, it's true in a lot of um, uh, in indigenous uh, uprisings throughout South America and in Africa and so forth. Does that, in itself, weave into uh, your motivation in writing? Is to kind of correct this error in history? Um, no, I wasn't. I wasn't trying to correct history with this. It, with, you know, when I write fiction, I don't. Um, my only real loyalty is to the characters and to their lives. Um, I don't really, I don't think about um, correcting history. I don't think about what the reader is going to think. I don't think about what my publisher is going to think. Um, and these are. These are intentional, conscious decisions that that I make, um, and I, I really just try to get to know the characters, um, to love them, and to to tell their story with auth authenticity and honesty, um, and that's really that's my only um, loyalty and aim when when I'm writing fiction. So no, I I don't, despite what. Um, Despite what it seems, because it is a, it is it's anything Palestinian ultimately is going to be political, um, just by by its existence, regardless of whether it touches on politics or not, it becomes political. But that's not my aim. Um, fiction is is about um, human stories. It's about emotion and heart and love. And I mean that's and to me that's what the story is. It's a love story ultimately, even though it's set against a lot of destruction and loss and heartache and politics. And of course the characters go through many uh, of the key issues that are so disturbing for people to witness um, in Palestine and in Gaza. One of your characters, uh, 
the son is a political prisoner mm-hmm. and there are numerous how many political prisoners not that <laughs> yeah so there's um the, the the male characters in this book are are the minor characters there are but there are there they exist um Nazmiya's son Nazmiya the the matriarch that I mentioned earlier um her eldest son uh was part of the resistance and he's ultimately uh arrested and sort of thrown um in an Israeli jails uh f- forever for <laughs> so you know it was a life sentence and um and that's you know that's part of the reality that Palestinians live with um no no Palestinian life is untouched by um by prisons or by death or or harassment i mean it is uh it's comprehensive the israeli occupation even for those of us who live in exile we are um we're profoundly touched and affected and violated by by the israeli occupation and the us support of that occupation the unquestioning us support of course um i uh you know living um in exile is itself a form of of violence i mean not being able to um essentially sort of you know being told by the world even by um by the government the united states government that you are not human enough or not the right kind of human or not worthy enough to inherit your own heritage to inherit um the your homeland to to be able to live in a place where you have a familial history that spans many centuries of documented um uh roots not just sort of uh you know religious roots or um historic uh stories that um that you may or may not be connected to or the religious history that we're all connected to these are um definitive indigenous cultural genetic um roots that Palestinians have and to be told that no um your 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 white american jewish neighbor is more worthy of that history than you are is um is deeply hurtful deeply humiliating um and it's 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 a collective wound that we all live with and try to contend with and we um it's you know it's it's the source of of our struggle it's the source of our pain and it's also the source of our identity and our power you recently uh attempted to go back into Palestine which you'd been to prior mm mm-hmm. in uh just the end of July of this year and mm-hmm. i i yeah. thought it was just a great illustration of what you are put portray in your writing can you talk about that <clears throat> yeah um so again i mean as a so as a us citizen um ostensibly i am afforded the ability to enter my homeland as a tourist um and it's really all we have to go back and to um to be in the places where you know all of our ancestors are buried where you know my parents have told me stories about you know growing up and grandparents and and to see homes that you know my family owned and orchards that my grandfather had planted and um so all we have is that that stupid little tourist visa um and and to get in usually we have to go through or at least I do I, I mean I've never been able to get in without um going through at least 6 hours of interrogations and searchings and searches and and you know often strip searches <clears throat> um but usually I I end up getting in This last time in July I had gone to I was going to um build uh playgrounds we we had seven playgrounds that um playgrounds for Palestine was building in uh, in the West Bank 
and I was going, um, they had already started the building and I was going to help complete them and also to have, you know, ribbon cutting ceremonies and to visit friends. And um, so at the border at the Allenby Bridge, I, um, uh, I waited. Um, I was with another board member. She's a, she's a Jewish American woman. Um, and when they realized she was with me, at first they were going to let her in, but then they made her wait as well. Uh, I had six different interrogators. They all asked the same questions. I answered all of their questions. Um, but of course, you know, they, they bring up, they Google everybody. And I mean, it's clear that I'm very um, uh, critical of Israel and, and very outspoken. So they knew that. And after seven and a half hours uh, of waiting and being interrogated, uh, they told me that I was not allowed to um, that I they were, I was denied entry basically, um, and they allowed Stephanie to go through, uh, the the other board member. And um, yeah. And it's not unusual. This happens to a lot of people, it, not just Palestinian Americans or Arab Americans, but um, any Americans or Europeans who um, seem sympathetic to Palestinians or people who they think are going to do something <laughs> beneficial for Palestinians. Um, Noam Chomsky, for example, was, he's one of the, you know, the more um, noteworthy personalities who was denied. Um, I also, there were, um, I knew of a couple of uh, American and European um, phys uh, IT uh, experts who were going to teach courses um, on software development or something for students and for Palestinian students. They had never been, and they really had no political affiliations. They really kind of didn't know much about the situation. And they were all summarily denied entry, um, you know, because they're going to teach courses <laughs> in software development. So, you know, this is, this is par for the course. And unfortunately, our the State Department does nothing about it. In fact, the State Department has on their website that, you know, sort of a, uh, a warning that Americans of Palestinian heritage um, are not going to be treated as American citizens. They'll be treated as Palestinians. Like, this is perfectly okay. And this is okay with um, with the State Department and for, for a country that uh, receives so much aid, so handouts. It's not even aid. I mean, it's a developed economy. Um, in that they have uh, you know taxpayer handouts in the billions um, and there's there's no protests there's nothing from the State Department and it's quite um, infuriating actually and those handouts are oftentimes in the form of US military weapons that are being used directly in these conflicts that yeah they're not conflicts. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah, I, that, that's not even the, the right word. I know everybody, it's hard to find the right words, but um, it's, this, this is a situation of, of supremacy, of entitlement, um, of settler colonialism. Um, it's ethnic cleansing. It's just, the, it's, it's a destruction of an entire indigenous population. That's what's happening. The goal of Zionism has always been to erase Palestine and establish in it uh, an exclusively Jewish population. I mean, that's been the goal of Zionism, and that's what's happening. Um, and it's been happening since the, the turn of the century. And the 2014 invasion attack uh, by Israel images were just I mean I'd been following this for some time but the visual images alone coming out of that were just unbelievable I mean it literally looked like uh, like something from Hiroshima mm -hmm. I mean some parts of the city of, uh, of Gaza yeah, and I, I think that, um, and I think what you see is really 
a very tiny fraction of what actually happened. I mean, that's, those are just the, the parts where somebody happened to have a, a camera and was able to film things. And I think that's, you know, it's one thing that's making, and this has been happening for, you know, of course for decades, but now this is the thing that's making uh, is the Israeli project a bit more difficult is because people are actually um, able to see for themselves what Israel is doing. And so technology has made um, obsolete or nearly obsolete the traditional gatekeepers of, of thought and knowledge. Uh, you know, CNN, MSNBC, uh, Fox News, of course, they all still spin it. They spin it um, hugely, and they still try to make it look like it's self-defense, which is incredible. It's, it's breathtaking the way that they, that they do that. Um, that this this enormous military power that's armed with the most technological death machines that rains death on a besieged, largely civilian population uh, with no army, no air force, no no real organized military that 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 they're actually defending defending themselves um, when they you know when they decimate. Uh, nearly all electrical plants, all water treatment systems, all sewage, all schools, mosques, hospitals, and and our media, our corporate media, continues to try to couch these um, y- y- this kind of cruelty in terms of self defense. It's mind boggling, um, but there are. Uh, more and more citizens around the world who are who are waking up to um, the absurdity of of corporate media spin, and uh, and and they're thinking for themselves, which is, which is a beautiful thing. And I that's one that's one of the great equalizing aspects of the internet and of technology. It's giving people direct access to one another, and it is really tearing down the 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 traditional gatekeepers um of that manipulate the way people think of of conflicts of uh of war of oppression so do you see that as meaningfully growing the the social media i know you use both facebook and twitter um, amongst other tools um Mm -hmm. Is that really getting uh, significant traction with people who uh, wouldn't know otherwise <clears throat> and who will act? That's always a key. Yeah. I, you know, social media, I mean, as, as we've seen um, all over the world, actually, has been a tremendous tool for activists um, to organize, to share information, um, to... Uh, to link up, to learn from each other. Um, I, you know, that's actually the principal thing that I use it for. I don't really post what I eat or <laughs> I washed my hair today or, <laughs> or the new nail polish color I have. I don't, I don't tend to do that. I mean, I, I get a lot of really great articles um, and analyses from all over the world, and, and that's what I love about social media. Um, I'm not terribly tech savvy, um, but I, I've managed to figure out Twitter and Facebook, <laughs> and I, uh, it's great. Yeah, I mean, I, you get articles um, that I wouldn't otherwise think to read, you know, from, uh, from Europe, from various African nations, from um, from South America, from Asia, and and you you get to see and read how other like activists, people on the ground, are um, are are dealing with their own realities rather than sort of waiting for um, CNN to contextualize something for you. Which I you know uh, I'm glad more and more people are getting away from that. But unfortunately, there's still a huge segment of the population that still kind of waits for these. Um, thought gatekeepers, what I call them, um, to to contextualize world events and tell people what to think. And it seems like there's somewhat of a response from those social media 
um, entities like let's say Facebook for example in responding to the the positive use or let's say or getting out stories that you or I might be interested in by ratcheting down the number of items our friends might be sending out that mm. we can actually see so unless you <laughs> manually go in and search through if I were to go to your page I could see everything you post but yeah. if I'm just in general looking yeah. at things I'm only seeing one or two of your posts go by in a given day or yeah week. yeah well that's why you know there's also other forms of social media like Twitter mm. um, and you know the, the hashtag revolution is kind of <laughs> really helps you narrow things down and um, so I think uh, despite those sort of those limitations, it's still a, a very po- they're still it's, they're very powerful tools. Um, at, at the same time, you know, there it works in the opposite direction too. But nonetheless, I mean, the technology has really revolutionized um, uh, leftist, radical, uh, socialist movements around the world. Um, movements for social justice. I, sh- I know social socialism sort of carries a negative connotation in this country unfortunately I don't think people really recognize the inherent justice in that system but I'll just say social justice movements and also the rise of key websites to get out information for instance uh, electronic intifada is a great Mm -hmm. website for information are there others that you regularly oh yeah turn to support yeah um the, you know, Electronic Intifada um, specifically deals with, uh, you know, Palestinian news items, and it's really been um, wonderful. It's been a wonderful resource for people to go to to get um, to get news about Palestine um, that otherwise would never be covered in, uh, you know, mainstream media in the U.S. Uh, there's there are a lot of uh, equally wonderful websites um, or independent media news outlets um, like the Palestine Chronicle, uh, Middle East Eye, um, there's Counterpunch, uh, Mondawis. Um, you know, I, I also, I get news from Al Jazeera, from, uh, from Pravda, uh, you know, Guernica Online, Guernica Mag, um, and yeah, I mean, they're just, uh, I'm trying to go through, like, some of the, <laughs> the articles I was reading this morning. Um, there's a lot of uh, good um, websites in translation um, out of France. Uh, sometimes the BBC is not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, in, in addition of, to the uh, online uh, resources, nothing still compares with meeting people face to face and that is what people here in uh, locally will be able to do with you you have two different book events coming up that yes. uh, we should let people know about we're just about out of time we're talking with Susan Abulhawa and she is the author of the new book The Blue Between Sky and Water and you're going to be speaking at two different venues today this afternoon at 1 p.m. you're going to be down at Orca Books in Olympia mm-hmm. and that's co-sponsored with the Rachel Corey Foundation and then you'll be coming back up here to Seattle this evening for a 7 p.m. talk at Elliott Bay Book Company. Yes. So two different uh, opportunities to uh, hear you talk and interact. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to say, actually, one of the characters in the book is um, is named after Rachel Corey. Oh. Yeah. She's, uh, she, you know, when, when Rachel Corey was killed in Gaza, um, you know, she, she became a Palestinian hero to all of us and and girls that were born that year were named Rachel um, but the the American pronunciation of Rachel eludes Arabic speakers so it would come out either as Rachel Rachel uh, sort of Arabized or people who were trying to you know pay attention to the ch sound it was Rachel um, so there's a there's a character in the book named Rachel <laughs> and I'll leave it on that <laughs> all right Well, with that, we are unfortunately out of time. I want to thank you very much for coming in and spending time with us this morning. Thank you, Mike. It was a pleasure.